Tonight's event is all about power. Who has it and why? How can we better understand power dynamics to make society work better for all? And how can each harness our own power to make change happen? When we think of power, we have to be careful about how we define it. It's not necessarily authority. And so I'm wondering if, if one of you, uh, maybe I'll start with Julie on this. Could you define power for us? And maybe then also, maybe Tiziana can define what power isn't. Uh, the fundamentals of power were the same thousands of years ago when human beings were getting organized to live together on this planet and that they will remain the same for as long as there will be human beings on this planet, assuming we get our act together and we save our planet. But so here we go. Where does power come from? Power resides in control over access to resources that other people value. The misconception of maybe this is the most uh, commonly held that power is a dirty business. It's a matter of manipulation. It's a matter of coercion, of cunning, of uh, stabbing people in the back. All of those Machiavellian interpretations of power that, uh, in fact, actually misrepresent poor Machiavelli, poor guy. He actually was not quite as uh, simplistic. It was quite sophisticated in understanding that, you know, that there's, there's a limit to that uh, conniving view of power. But power ultimately is not intrinsically good or bad. To understand why fear works, but it's not the only thing that works in, in attracting people's attention and getting them on board. You have to go back to the most fundamental human needs. And one is a need for safety. And then we want to feel that we have value. Those two basic needs are what leaders that try to appeal to us go for. And there are some that go for the feeling of you know, who you are and they may want to make you feel better about yourself and maybe pursue a more aspirational way of uh, projecting onto you what they will bring you if you elect them. The Kennedy brothers were capable of projecting a image of, of what we can accomplish together that speaks to those needs, that those valued resources, achievement. We can go to the moon. We can do something extraordinary. A collective belonging. We are in the same arena together. And if we help each other, we can do amazing. So ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. We are one we are the solidarity, we are there's togetherness. Those were wonderful ideals. It's, a, it's, a, it's an aspiration for greatness and goodness. And then you have the other side. You can appeal to our need for safety by highlighting what we should be fearful of. And then come along and say, don't worry. I'll protect you if you give me power to do all the things, including surveilling you, including um, a, a spying on you, as long as I guarantee protection. And by the way, along the way, you're great. You particularly. And look at the other group. They're not good. You are much better than them. And they are here threatening you. And so let me come and lift up your group because we have to fight back against the others. That's fear. And it works great because it appeals to both a sense of safety and a sense of self-esteem. We've been experiencing a crisis that's not only a health crisis, but that is also a social and economic crisis characterized by rising inequalities on top of an environmental crisis that has been ongoing for a long time. We can actually trace the roots back to neoliberalism, right? This doctrine that has focused all of our attention and energy on maximizing financial value and profit. Now, what about the leaders? The leaders are undeniably facing difficult challenges. We need courageous leaders who are going to be courageous enough to say change is needed. And we're talking about a quite divergent change, breaking with the norms, breaking with the power hierarchy so that we make a society that's going to be greener, fairer, and more democratic. We want leaders who are not going to abuse their power. We do know that power does two things to us. It makes us more self-centered, and more hubristic, right? So ideally, if you want to counter these poisons of power, what do you need? You need to cultivate empathy to counter self-centeredness, right? 
And you also need to cultivate humility to counter hubris. So now it means that ideally we would need the kind of leaders who are politically savvy, who can make the courageous decisions, but who have the, the empathy and humility to understand that they cannot decide by themselves. And finally, we would need leaders who could understand the global and local levels, like the crisis is multidimensional crisis locally and globally. It is true that the powerful can benefit greatly for a certain period of time, but the benefit actually morphs into a decrease of the global prosperity. So even in organization, this also happens. Yes, the CEO may have this kind of uh, top-down authority over people. When you have a lot of power imbalance, yes, the powerful may take a bigger piece of the pie, but the pie shrinks over time. We could have done much better by distributing power a little more equally. Why do we need that? Because we are highly interdependent in organizations. So we face the crisis that Julie was describing are real and present for all of us. And the question is who is, is well positioned to make decisions about how to approach this crisis? You alone in your own corner, because you're, you're so brilliant that of course you can decide for everybody and they should just do what you say. Or perhaps you wanna listen to the people who are in the trenches, the people who work and are essential and carry the load for us while we work safely from home to tell us what they needed and would have had some decision-making power to shape their environment, to do a better job. Of course, we would have been better off. What you have to do as a leader is not micromanage and command people. You have to give them clear expectations of what they're supposed to do, clear goals, a mission, something to, to aim for, proper feedback so that they know what, how they're doing, and then give them the power to decide for themselves how to carry out the work. So relinquishing, relinquishing control is actually a way to boost your own effectiveness in the long run. So a more balanced power relationship tend to be uh, more beneficial for the people involved than these extremely imbalanced ones. When I think about a CEO, there's also on the flip side, the board. Uh, usually companies have boards and they have their own power. And so you're kind of sandwiched in between. And you see this, not just boards, shareholders, long-termism versus short-termism, uh, the pursuit of profits on a quarterly basis versus the saving of the planet and stakeholder capitalism and everything else that we talk about. What you have to do as a change maker is A, understand power get to really understand what is it that people need and want. What you also have to do is obviously realize that you're not going to do that by yourself. Within your organization, you have to create a coalition. And then finally, this is critical. We don't only need to share power, we need to hold those in power accountable, not only for financial performance, but also for their social and environmental performance. Think about a world in which we would really be using not only the financial, but also the social and environmental performance of corporations. If we were to now make it the norm to have corporations report on those dimensions, to have investors use those different criteria to make their decisions, then we would be in a world in which if you did well on all three dimensions, you would be celebrated and you would not be sanctioned. And we'll probably at some point have to really incentivize companies. And let's say you do well on all three dimensions, your corporate taxes are not going to be as high maybe as other companies that may do so well financially, but so poorly on the social and environmental front. So again, we have the tools. It's about making now the legislation evolve. You're, you're getting coffee for people as a first rung ladder. You're working your 90 hour weeks and you feel like you have no power. How do you know if you have power at that stage? And, and how do you, when you're in the earlier parts of your career, establish your power? Mm, fantastic question. Uh, and actually, it's a question that is one of the biggest motivators for Julie and me writing this book. And it's uh, very frustrating to have so much to give and not, and not finding a way to give it. So to the young person who graduates, starts a new job and brings coffee to people. Uh, you may not be totally incorrect that you don't have a whole lot of power because you remember what we said, power is the ability to influence the behavior of others. So you have to be the conduit through which they get a hold of a resource that they value. 
what resource can you bring when you're new and uh, inexperienced and so on and so forth you can understand the people you're trying to influence and then use whatever means you have maybe your informal network maybe there's a boss who appreciates you and you can kind of persuade them to change this particular script change agents because it would make their work much better and you activate the little resources you have along the way you can do a lot with power mapping that's what we talk about uh, how this, we describe this process understanding who has power why and it all comes down to what's valued in that environment and who controls access to those things and can i find a way to deliver of the, those valued things that make me relevant how do you empower others well you do it in, in the recognizing that everybody's better off when you do and you you get such greatness people put them in 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 in, in, in the condition to do the best work they can. And that requires not being insecure, uh, having a consciousness of who you are, uh, words and all, uh, we all have limitations, but that's where great leadership emerges, that we, Julie and I are aware of our limitations and are aware of, of how the other person complements us. We cite Toni Morrison in the book, who actually said, if you have any power, your job is to empower somebody else. And I'm not saying we always manage to do that. We're human. We, like anyone else, need to work on cultivating empathy and humility, and we have our ups and downs. But being guided by that kind of principle is, I think, very helpful.